How are you guys? I wanted to start off just by um, thanking the congregation for hosting this event. These are um, important, uh, I think, discussions about the history of Texas religion, but also um, interfaith discussions um, for even what's going on today. So I appreciate the congregation hosting, and thank you guys for coming out. Um, I'm also happy to be back in Waco as a, um, a Baylor guy, um, not a Baptist though, so I'm writing about a subject and I actually um, start with this slide because this is from the Baptist Standard in uh, 1983 and you can see um, that even back then there was this big question about who actually speaks for Texas Baptist with uh, a number of different answers and a lot of different people um, with, uh, with stakes um, in that. Um, so. I'm happy to be here and I definitely appreciate you guys having me. The 1984 presidential election pitted the popular Republican incumbent, Ronald Reagan, against the Democratic challenger, Walter Mondale. By then, a majority of white Southerners had staked out a position of strong support for the Republican Party in general. As 1984 standard bearer, that fall, 81% of Southern Baptist ministers voted for Reagan the highest recorded percentage up to that point for a Republican candidate. Thank you. Despite that trend, the Baptist Standard, the news magazine of Texas Baptist, refused to support either candidate and ran several editorials seeming to support Mondale's position on the proper relationship between church and state. Noting that a great deal of, quote, political thunder had erupted between the two candidates on church-state issues, the editors came to the quick defense of those arguing for a strict separation. The editorial quoted that most famous champion of religious liberty and church-state separation, Thomas Jefferson. Believing with you that religion lies solely between a man and his God, I contemplate with solemn reverence that act of the whole American people, which declared that their legislatures shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof thus building a wall of separation between church and state. Critiquing those who believed that the separation of church and state was a modern invention, the editors insisted that it was, quote, mostly a Baptist achievement, and warned that no revision of history can write out the constitutional concept of separation of church and state. Finally, the editorial proclaimed boldly, as champions of religious liberty and church-state separation, Southern Baptists should be at the front in shedding light on the subject. That the official news organ of the country's largest state Baptist organization would run such an editorial might seem surprising to contemporary observers of white evangelical politics. The editorial's basic premise flies in the face of the Christian rights agenda and by extension that of the modern Republican Party. But in taking their 1984 stance, Texas Baptists were actually acting in a long tradition of supporting the separation of church and state. The reasons for Texas Baptist's reluctance to follow their denomination's drift towards Republican activism and an alliance with the Christian right are complicated and they touch on questions of race, gender, and intra-denominational politics. But their unwavering support for the traditional Baptist view on the separation of church and state was clearly the most powerful force in preventing any kind of partnership with leaders of the Christian right and the Republican Party. I want to just um, answer briefly this question, because a lot of times people will say, what exactly do we mean by the Christian right? And there's a lot of, um, there's a lot at stake in how we answer the question. So I'll give you just sort of this rough definition that I've used. Um, a group of voters motivated primarily by their religious beliefs and concern for social issues. The group includes Protestant evangelicals, Orthodox Catholics, and conservative members of mainline Protestant denominations. You know, um, a, a lot of times you won't have people who would say, I'm a member of the Christian right. You know, it's not something you can really carry a card for, but at the same time, historians, sociologists, political scientists, and others have found it useful to look at this as a somewhat cohesive group. Um, so when I talk about this group, I just want to acknowledge, obviously, that there's a lot of complexities um, at stake uh, with that group and a lot of um, differences even present within that group, yet we will try to look at them and their relationship to Texas Baptists. Long before abortion, lesbian and gay rights, and school prayer became voting issues for many white Southerners, Texas Baptists had developed a tradition of strong support for the separation of church and state. Although they ultimately parted ways with many other Southern Baptists, 
who more or less abandoned the separation of church and state as a guiding principle, Texas Baptists were originally on the same page with the national denomination and quite consistent with the historic emphasis of nearly all Baptists. Church historian Bill Leonard is surely correct in his assessment that Baptists have been, quote, among the most outspoken advocates of religious liberty in modern Protestant history who have often identified themselves with the general support for the separation of church and state, the belief that government should not interfere in matters of religion. That conviction has manifested itself in a variety of ways throughout Baptist history, but an unwavering commitment to each individual's right to make her own religious choices has been a hallmark of the Baptist faith. To fully understand their complicated relationship with the Christian right and their response to politics after 1960, historians must contend with their views on church-state separation, for it is that element of their ideology that most influenced Texas Baptists to reject an alliance with the burgeoning movement of religious conservatives in the 1970s and in the 1980s. By the time the Christian right formally organized, Texas Baptists had already staked their claim on the side of church-state separation. Their activities in the 1960s and 1970s demonstrate clearly some of the reasons they would ultimately offer a different response to the Christian right than many of their Southern counterparts. During the 1960s, the first issue to draw Texas Baptists into a strong defense of church-state separation was a question of public funding for private religious-based schools. On the surface, aid to private schools might not seem like a dividing issue for Baptists and Catholics. As the Christian right gained power in the 1970s and 1980s, and as Southern whites were increasingly forced to send their children to schools with African-American students, Protestant schools did grow rapidly. But during the early years of John Kennedy's administra administration, a huge discrepancy existed between Catholic schools and other private religious academies. You can see here the numbers, I think, that demonstrate that point in 1960. Huge numbers of uh, school children in Catholic schools, very, very few in Protestant or Jewish schools. That's, of course, not true today, um, but it was when um, Texas Baptists first formulated their response to the Christian right. As Kennedy's administration began, Texas Baptists worried that Catholics would push for public funding of these schools, and prominent Catholic leaders had already gone on record supporting such aid. The Supreme Court's Everson versus Board of Education decision in 1947 had deemed direct funding of private schools unconstitutional, but it had not examined the issues of federal aid for transportation, school health care, school lunches, and textbooks that were not religious in nature. Supporters hoped that Kennedy's election would help their cause, and the issue was politically provocative in 1960. Citing theological and political concerns about the divide between government and church organizations, Texas Baptists staked out a clear position against public funding for religious-based schools. In educating Baptists on issues of church-state separation and promoting a pro-separation position, no agency was more influential than the Baptist Joint Committee on Public Affairs. Prominent Texas Baptist J.M. Dawson was instrumental in creating that agency, and he served as its head from 1946 to 1953. Dawson was a longtime pastor in Waco, Texas, and of course the J.M. Dawson Institute for Church-State Studies at Baylor is a testament to his legacy. During the 1950s, Dawson had issued clear warnings to Baptists about the employment of nuns in public schools, the use of publicly funded buses for transporting students to parochial schools, federal grants for the construction of religious schools, and a number of actions by local school boards that he considered antithetical to the country's legal traditions of church and state. One specific case in the early 1960s seemed to confirm Texas Baptist suspicions that government monies were being used for private religious purposes. In Bremen, a small town in East Central Texas with a large Catholic population, an elementary school became cause for controversy. Starting in 1948, the local school board leased a public building to St. Mary's Elementary for the ridiculous sum of $1 per year. The school essentially operated on the basis of government funding with publicly financed school buses taking the children to school. But despite its source of funding, the school functioned largely as a private Catholic institution. The faculty was composed almost entirely of nuns who wore religious garb to work. Catholic imagery filled the school's walls and billboards. 
Priests often visited the school and an entire section of the library was devoted to Catholic literature. By 1958, the Texas Christian Life Commission had taken notice of the issue. Foy Valentine, who you can see here, uh, was an instrumental uh, and influential Texas Baptist who headed the Texas Christian Life Commission at the time. And he was instrumental in founding the Citizens Association for Free Public Schools, which brought a lawsuit against the school district on grounds that the enterprise violated the constitutional separation between church and state. By 1962, the district agreed to discontinue the practice, ending the court battle and earning Texas Baptists a clear victory in the fight to oppose the merging of church and state. Valentine, along with E.S. James, who was editor of the Baptist Standard, uh, the main news magazine for Texas Baptists at the time, became a hero of sorts to Baptists focused on church-state issues. His stance was unequivocal, and in the 1960s, he laid the groundwork for what would become 40 years of activism on the issue. Quote, in those days, there was a pretty strong consensus among Baptist people generally, but Baptist leaders particularly, that separation of church and state was the best guarantee of religious liberty. Referring to what would become a favored term of the Christian right, Valentine insisted that church-state separation was, quote, not a shibboleth of doctrinaire secularism, but was indeed a primary plank in the Baptist platform. As early as the 1960s, he was determined to oppose, quote, people who were not historically rooted as Baptists who wanted government support for private schools. To Valentine and other Texas Baptist leaders, such a position was the only possible Baptist response given their denomination's history of supporting the separation of church and state. But their impulse to defend that separation would put them at direct odds with other Baptists who would eventually join with leaders of the Christian right to reshape American politics. The activism of Valentine, James, and other Texas Baptists during the 1960s established a pattern of political activity that really put them on a collision course with evangelicals. That split wouldn't become evident until the late 1970s, but given the stridency with which Texas Baptists defended church and state in the 1960s, it was also inevitable. Of all the issues that captivated Texas Baptists during the 1960s, none could match the passion generated by the Supreme Court's 1962 ruling on school prayer, Ingle v. Vital. The six to one decision embraced the claims of plaintiffs that the reading of a 22 word official school prayer was unconstitutional and could not be allowed in public schools. The broad scope of the decision, which dubbed organized school prayer, quote, an establishment of religion, forbidden by the First Amendment of the Constitution, was clear at the time of the ruling. Justice Hugo Black insisted, quote, in this country, it is no business of government to compose official prayers for any group of the American people to recite. He argued that placing, quote, the power, prestige, and financial support of government behind any religious practice amounted to religious coercion and was forbidden by the First Amendment. By offering such a broad interpretation of the Establishment Clause, Black and his fellow justices made clear that the court would not tolerate any form of organized religion in public schools. The impact of the decision was felt immediately, and it was certainly not lost on Southerners who had long complained that the federal government and its courts were growing too intrusive. The New York Times noted that the initial reaction in Congress was dominated by unfavorable comment from Southern members. To give you an example of some of the kind of extreme rhetoric that um, came with this, you can see uh, the reaction of Representative George Andrews of Alabama. First, they put the Negroes in school, and now they've driven God out of the public schools. Not all Southerners expressed their conviction with such flagrant racism, but huge numbers of white Southerners opposed the Supreme Court's ruling as an attack on their deepest values and an attempt by the federal courts to undermine them. The response of Texas Baptists to the issue demonstrated a different sensibility to issues of church-state separation. The reaction from these Southern Protestants could not have been more different from George Andrews' feelings, and it helps explain why Texas Baptists ultimately rejected an alliance with leaders of the Christian right. Texas Baptist leadership generally welcomed the decision in contrast to their Southern Protestant counterparts. E.S. James insisted that God had not been driven from the public schoolroom by the U.S. Supreme Court. What the court had done in James's mind 
was ruled that prescribed and controlled religion should not be forced upon students by the power of government. The decision was moral, fair, American, and best for the preservation and progress of the nation. When asked to join a crusade to enact what people were calling, quote, an amendment for God, codifying the right to organize school prayer, he became even more explicit and infuriating to his fellow Southerners. Quote, this country doesn't need an amendment for God, he replied. God was not brought into American life by the adoption of the Constitution, and his tenure here will not be determined by acts of Congress nor by ballots of the people. The TCLC, Texas Christian Life Commission, had condemned all official religious activity on public school grounds as early as 1958, and its leadership strongly supported the Supreme Court's decision issuing a statement of support. James Dunn was another uh, prominent Texas Baptist who served as executive director of the Texas Christian Life Commission. After the ruling, he shared the disdain of other Texas Baptist leaders for attempts to reverse the decision. He derided, quote, the recurring attempts to pass a prayer amendment to, quote, put prayer back in the schools as if you loaded up a wheelbarrow with prayer and just shoved it back into the public schools. As leader of the TCLC, he, quote, called upon Texas Baptists to recognize that the best thing government can do for religion is to leave it alone. And that was consistent with the church state position we'd taken all along. Foy Valentine also agreed with the Supreme Court's ruling and struggled to understand why some Baptists viewed it as an assault on Christianity. After all, he was quick to note, the majority of Texas Baptists and of Southern Baptists really supported the idea of separation of church and state. It was pretty much in our bloodstream, end quote. At the time, leaders like James, Dunn, and Valentine could not have known how contentious issues of church-state separation would eventually become. They just viewed their position as the logical extension of a Baptist tradition that was as dear to them as any other. But their support for the court's decision placed them on the opposite side of a great political divide that would ultimately reshape Southern politics and, by extension, U.S. politics. Although it would be another 15 years before the Christian right would formally organize under Jerry Falwell's leadership, these Texas Baptists drew a line in the sand on church-state issues that ensured they would never join other Southern evangelicals in gravitating towards the Christian right. In the early 1970s, Texas Baptists again opposed state aid to private religious institutions. A lingering bill in the Texas legislature would have provided up to $50 million of aid to those schools by funding non-religious activities, such as the hiring of teachers to provide instruction in secular subjects, the purchase of books, and again, transportation costs, particularly buses. The Baptist General Convention of Texas adopted an official stance against such funding at its annual meeting, proclaiming, quote, Baptists are committed to religious liberty and its corollary to separation of church and state, a strong public school system, and racial justice. We call on Texas Baptists to support the expenditure of public funds for only public schools through public channels. With that statement of support from the state convention, the Texas Christian Life Commission went to work opposing the bill and encouraging Texas Baptists to contact their representatives with their concerns. In a TCLC report that was widely distributed in Baptist churches, Associate Director Phil Strickland outlined the primary reasons for his organization's opposition to the bill. First, it would ultimately draw funding away from public school. Quote, the education tax dollar will stretch only so far. The public is committed by tradition, constitution, frequent vote, and legislation to support public schools. It has no obligation to support private schools. But Strickland did not limit his concern to the issue of funding. He went further, arguing that the proposed funding would exacerbate the existing problem of educational inequality. Texas would move towards government sponsorship of two separate educational systems, he wrote. This would guarantee inequality of opportunity. Finally, he invoked the Texas Constitution, noting that it prohibited, quote, direct or indirect tax aid to churches. Quote, no matter how carefully drawn, the legislation would violate that prohibition, he wrote. With the support of the state convention, the TCLC acted to make Texas Baptist a central political player in the battle over state funding for private religious schools. In April 19, 1971, the state legislature debated the bill, 
sponsored by Representative Raul Longoria of Edinburgh. Jimmy Allen of the Texas Christian, Leader, uh, Texas Christian Life Commission led the fight against the bill, gathering opponents from a diversity of backgrounds to testify against it in the state legislature. When he did this, by the way, I should point out, he made common cause with Americans United for Separation of Church and State, of which he was a board member, and also the NAACP, which was strongly opposed to the bill. You can see Allen was unequivocal in his stance. Quote, any attempt to aid parochial schools from tax money is patently unconstitutional under the Texas Constitution. It is unwise as far as public education is concerned and is unthinkable as a violation of the free religious conscience. The Baptist Standard joined the chorus of, the, of those opposing the bill. Editor E.S. James emphasized what he saw as misleading arguments by supporters saying that they cloud the issue with their cry about double taxation, taxes for public schools while having to pay tuition for their children in parochial schools. But there is no compulsion in the latter. They ignore the double taxation, which will come our way if we have to support both church and public schools. In working against public funding for private schools, Allen and James reiterated the Texas Baptist position of strong church-state separation at the same time, the Christian right had not formally organized, much less developed its ideology on issues of church and state. But this was an early indication that their basic assumptions would conflict with those of Texas Baptists, whose leaders supported government funding of, uh, who opposed government funding of private schools from the earliest days. By the summer of 1971, Texas Baptists were fighting off yet another challenge a proposed prayer amendment in the U.S. House of Representatives that was being pushed by conservative groups. The amendment was designed, again, as a response to the Supreme Court's 1963 decision banning organized school prayer. Its supporters believed that it was a necessary supplement to the First Amendment statement on religion and free speech given the court's ruling. The amendment simply read, nothing contained in this Constitution shall abridge the rights of persons lawfully assembled in any public building which is supported in whole or in part through the expenditure of public funds to participate in non-denominational prayer. According to proponents, this amendment would effectively have prevented the Supreme Court from banning organized prayer and Bible reading in public schools. But opponents noted that religious groups had rarely been able to agree on what a, quote, non-denominational prayer actually looked like. Supporters worked tirelessly through the summer to gain the 218 sponsors that would force the issue to a vote on the House floor. As I read that, I realized that given the events of the last week, that may sound kind of uh, something that relates to present day life, trying to get 218 votes to get them to vote on something. Um, but the Baptist Joint Committee on Public Affairs, the political advocacy arm of the National Convention, had warned repeatedly that the amendment would fundamentally alter the First, first Amendment thus crumbling the wall of separation between church and state. The Southern Baptist Convention had passed resolutions affirming their support for the First Amendment and in opposition to any changes that could affect its meaning. In 1964 and 1971, Southern Baptists passed resolutions opposing changes to the First Amendment, and Texas Baptists were generally supportive of that position. The Baptist Standard was adamant in its opposition to the amendment. A pointed editorial claimed that while the bill, quote, appears harmless at first glance, it raises far more questions than it answers. Supporters of the bill were vague about what exactly it would do. After all, non-denominational prayer could mean things in different schools in different parts of the country. But the editors of the Baptist Standard were certain that whatever its effects, the results would be nefarious. Quote, we think the proposed amendment will permit government-ordered prayers. Such eliminates volunteerism, which is basic to our understanding of prayer. Such becomes a ritual and is without meaning to either God or man. The editors were especially concerned that the phrase non-denominational necessarily would include faiths far outside the Protestant tradition. Quote, what about our Jewish friends? Are we to ignore the Muslim and the Hindu? satisfy everyone with, quote, non-denominational, and we have an idea that God might rather be ignored, end quote. More than even these concerns, the editors expressed a reverence for the First Amendment 
and a concern that tampering with it would undermine religious freedom and the separation of church and state. They insisted that, quote, anything that has stood so well the test of time should have proven itself in almost 200 years. After laying out their various complaints, the editors warned ominously that tampering with the First Amendment could be far more dangerous than we would like to imagine. By the 1980s, the cause of organized prayer in public schools would become a rallying point for religious conservatives. The distinction between organized prayer and voluntary prayer was often lost as conservative Christians spoke of a government attempt to, quote, ban God from the public sphere. But for Texas Baptists, this distinction was crucial to their opposition to a prayer amendment. A resolution of the Baptist Joint Committee on Public Affairs insisted, quote, at no time has the Supreme Court prohibited voluntary prayer, but it has always ruled against government prescribed prayer. Going further, a representative of the organization stated, quote, we ought to be applauding the Supreme Court in these cases. We ought to hang our heads in shame that an agnostic took this issue to the Supreme Court before we Baptists did. I want to turn now um, to a subject that um, I think in addition to prayer in schools and private funding, a uh, public funding of private schools, really gets to the heart of where Texas Baptists um, differed with the Christian right and maybe shows that while they weren't um, especially liberal, they also uh, had a hard time making common cause with leaders like Jerry Falwell, Pat Robertson, and those who came after, and that would be the issue of abortion rights. Observers of Southern Baptist politics in recent years are often very surprised to learn that the denomination was one of the first in the country to offer political cover for pro-choice activists by supporting the liberalization of the country's abortion laws. At the Southern Baptist Convention's annual meeting in 1971, messengers, as delegates of the convention are called, met in St. Louis to determine the convention's official position on a range of controversial issues including the topic of abortion, which was becoming a potent national issue at the time. After a floor debate, not unusual for any Baptist convention, if you've ever been to one, uh, they have floor debates uh, pretty much every five minutes over just about every topic you could imagine, including uh, the color of carpets in the church. So that's usually a big topic of debate. Um, but the SBC passed a resolution supporting federal legislation that, quote, will allow the possibility of abortion under such conditions as rape, incest, clear evidence of fetal deformity, and carefully ascertained evidence of the likelihood of damage to the emotional, mental, and physical health of the mother. The language of that resolution was striking, particularly the insistence that abortion should be allowed even in cases when the woman's physical health was not threatened, but her emotional or mental state might be. Certainly that statement did not place Southern Baptists on the left end of the spectrum on reproductive issues, and it did leave room for a lot of disagreement with, feminist push, with the feminist push for wholesale liberalization. But it was a decidedly moderate statement by a conservative denomination that became crucial to the anti-abortion coalition in the late 1970s and early 1980s. The Southern Baptist Convention went on record favoring some form of legal abortion at that 71 convention, but it was not until 1973 that the issue really became a dominant one in national American politics. That, of course, was the year of the Supreme Court's Roe v. Wade ruling, which prevented states from banning abortions for most reasons within the first trimester, allowing for legal abortion access across the country. Although the SBC would eventually become a staunch opponent of abortion rights, the initial reaction from Baptist leaders was not especially conservative. Texas Baptists in particular stood out for their moderation. James Wood, a Texas Baptist who led the Baptist Joint Committee on Public Affairs, opposed an amendment to the Constitution restricting abortion. Conservative congressmen were already circulating plans for an amendment that would grant full constitutional rights to, quote, unborn offspring at every stage of their biological development. At Wood's behest, the committee voted to oppose such measures at its semi-annual meeting in 1973. Wood emphasized that the resolution was not in support of the practice of abortion, but simply an affirmation of, quote, civil liberties and religious freedom for individuals as they determine their response to the issue. 
Wood's tendency to view the issue in terms of religious liberty and the separation of church and state was pretty typical of Texas Baptist leaders in the early 1970s. But their views on the subject would eventually be drowned out by the more rabid response from other elements of the Southern Baptist Convention. The pro-choice tendencies of Texas Baptist leaders eventually gave way to the stridently anti-choice views of fundamentalists like Paige Patterson and Paul Pressler, who seized power in the convention in the late 1970s and early 1980s. But as late as 1974, the pro-choice views of Texas Baptists were in step with the National Southern Baptist Convention. At the convention's annual meeting, conservatives proposed a resolution opposing all abortions without exceptions for rape, incest, or the life and health of the mother. That resolution lost by a wide margin, an indication that, at least in 1974, a more moderate view of the issue was dominant in Southern Baptist circles. After losing that resolution, conservatives tried to repeal the 1971 resolution, which had endorsed legislation that would allow for abortion, quote, under such conditions as rape, incest, or clear evidence of fetal deformity. But messengers reaffirmed the stance by a wide margin, margin, ending fundamentalist hopes of making the convention a vehicle for anti-abortion politics, at least for the time being. By the mid-1980s, Texas Baptist leaders would, moder would be moderate outliers in a convention that had become extremely conservative on reproductive issues, in both its official proclamations and in its chosen leadership. But it is important to recall that the convention's ultimate anti-choice stance was the result of a protracted struggle between two visions of Baptist politics, not the foregone result of Baptist theology. Indeed, it was Baptist history and belief particularly regarding the separation of church and state that led Baptist moderates to oppose universal restrictions on abortion in these early years of the abortion wars. Foy Valentine's response was especially interesting. To his mind, the issue was always more of a Roman Catholic one than a Baptist one, at least politically, and he didn't remember it being a significant debate among Baptists until the 1970s. Quote, the subject didn't even surface until about 1970. Now the Roman Catholic bishops started pressing on this stuff in the early 40s. They were pressing a little more in the 50s. Into the 60s, they were pressing. Not until the bishops had worked at it for decades did they politicize the issue enough to get it into the thinking of Baptist people, end quote. For Valentine, the decision to bring the abortion debate into the political realm was a Roman Catholic one that Southern Baptists ought not to emulate. Quote, our response to the challenges related to abortion shouldn't be based on Roman Catholic dogma or the Pope's notion as to when life begins or any of the old doctrines from Augustine to Aquinas, he insisted. Instead, quote, it should be based on theological and psychological truth and our convictions about it. Anti-abortion politics came to unite evangelicals and Catholics in the 1980s. But at the time Roe was decided, the two groups were still very divided over theological and sometimes political issues. Valentine's reluctance to embrace what he saw as a Catholic political agenda was not unique among Southern Baptists, especially those in Texas. As with most other social or political issues, moderate Baptists like Valentine were broadly conservative in their outlook, but they resented the all-or-nothing attitude about abortion that Christian right activists pushed, and they questioned the wisdom of pursuing an exclusively political strategy on an issue that for them held private religious significance. Valentine summed it up this way, quote, abortion is not a satisfactory or morally justified way of birth control. Yet, he continued, we should accept it as the least objectionable lesser of available evils in cases of rape, incest, manifest deformity to the life of the fetus, or clear danger to the physical or mental health of the mother. It was Valentine's response to the 1973 Roe decision that cemented his reputation as an opponent of the Christian right and an opponent of Baptist fundamentalists. At the time, he served as executive director of the Christian Life Commission, the National Baptist Agency responsible for dealing with major social issues. After the fact, he described the strategy that made him an enemy of anti-abortion forces. Quote, we sought to resist the extremist right-wing forces that sought to use Christians in general, and Baptists in particular, for political ends, and made abortion their rallying cry. 
I wanted to show you this quote on uh, Jerry Falwell, who of course was one of the earliest American evangelicals to bring abortion into the political realm. We sought to resist the extremist right-wing forces uh, that sought to use Christians in general and Baptists in particular for their political ends. We sought to resist people like Jerry Falwell who was wont to wear a gold fetus in his lapel as a symbol of his concern about it. He also had special scorn for Francis Schaeffer, another of these early uh, leaders in the abortion wars. Quote, we sought to resist Francis Schaeffer, the daddy rabbit of the present right-wing fundamentalist, who as a former associate of Carl McIntyre's little one-eyed fundamentalist school in Pennsylvania, his only formal education he kind of threw in there, uh, was pressing for a constitutional amendment. He could barely, could barely disguise his contempt for such leaders, and his refusal to endorse a constitutional amendment banning all abortion was at the heart of his differences with fundamentalist Baptists. Besides his disagreement with pro-lifers over sexual education and the legality of abortion, Valentine also rejected their near-exclusive focus on abortion, uh, the near-exclusive focus on abortion of some members of the Christian right, who, quote, wanted us to be dealing with that issue above all others. The anti-abortionists, he continued, are simply a one theme people who would like to see us doing nothing about hunger or race relations or citizenship or separation of church and state or morality or hardly anything else just as long as we were talking about their accepted belief that the life in its full human form begins at the moment of conception. James Dunn was another of these influential Texas Baptists who pressed for a moderate response to the abortion question. He used his position as head of the Texas Life Commission and the Baptist Joint Committee to battle what he saw as an overzealous response to abortion from the fundamentalist camp. At the 1974 annual meeting, he spoke in favor of the resolution affirming the right of women to choose abortion in some circumstances. Following the adoption of that policy, he noted with pride that the convention, quote, overwhelmingly rejected an abortion as murder resolution. He, is especially, he was especially pleased that Southern Baptists went overwhelmingly on record with a rather open position on abortion. Quote, it's probably good that these guys brought it up so we could take this position and make it clear that the convention is not a conservative convention on the abortion issue as were so often labeled in the national media. Like most other Baptist moderates, he refused to support what he called, quote, abortion on demand, but he did insist that legal abortion should be allowed in cases of rape, incest, clear evidence of fetal deformity, or, quote, clearly ascertained indication of damage to the physical, mental, and emotional health of the mother. His call for rejecting the extremes of abortion on demand or abortion is murder under all circumstances, that's his quote, was perfectly in tune with the national convention in the mid-1970s, but it was out of step with the fundamentalist crusade to ban all abortions that would eventually come to dominate Southern Baptist's position on the issue. His moderate voice on this issue was another example of the growing divergence between the emergent, emerging movement of Christian right activists and Texas Baptists. The years between 1960 and 1980 were years of great political, social, and religious change in the United States. In general, white Southerners shifted to the Republican Party, the Christian right established itself as a political force, and its leaders made attacking church-state separation one of the movement's central aims. But it is important to note that for all these changes, Texas Baptists ended the period mostly on the same ideological terrain as when it commenced. On issues of politics, no impulse was more overriding than the historic Baptist fidelity to the principle of church-state separation. The difference is that by 1984, that position placed them mostly at odds with the national denomination and with the political winds that were changing the American South into a bastion of Republican Party politics and a haven for the Christian right. The story of Texas Baptists during the 1970s and early 1980s is one that should give pause to historians who've assumed a natural cohesion between devout Southern Baptists and the new movement of social conservatives that came to dominate the Republican Party in the 1980s. Texas Baptists never abandoned their core emphasis of missions, evangelism, and personal redemption. They simply rejected the shift away from church-state separation 
and argued that a pro-separation position was more in keeping with historic Baptist principles than the pet causes of the Christian right. Their experience in these years belies the popular narrative that Southern Protestants made easy alliance with the Christian right and the Republican Party. In fact, not all Southern religionists found that alliance appealing, and Texas Baptists continued to oppose it long after the Christian right had established itself as a powerful force in national politics. I'm happy to take questions, and thank you guys so much for having me. Very good. Do you have any comments or questions? We're such a small group, I feel like I don't need the microphone if I can <laughs> answer a question. Oh, yeah. Can you tell us more about the bigger project that this is related to and how you got involved in looking at it? Um, it's interesting because, you know, I came to graduate school thinking I would study um, either feminist politics or you know, gay and lesbian politics or the civil rights movement, and then I somehow ended up studying uh, conservative Baptist evangelicals, which made my uh, father, who's a preacher, very happy. Um, but the larger project looks at Texas Baptists and how they negotiated the Christian right when it began to organize. It's a little different because um, Texas Baptists in the 60s and 70s, and even before that, were very active on church-state issues. But then in the 70s and, 70s and 80s, the Christian right really moves in a completely different direction. So what I've argued in the past is that most of the literature on the Christian right more or less says that white Southern evangelicals just easily moved over into the Republican Party and easily embraced an anti-abortion, anti-gay politics. Uh, Texas Baptists actually didn't, and Texas Baptists weren't the only ones. There were a number of Southern Baptists who continued to focus on church-state separation, and they continued to run editorial after editorial after editorial, criticizing um, the policies of Ronald Reagan, speaking out for opposition to prayer in public school. Um, and, and I think it's a complicated story, and what I would argue is that um, the religion and politics of white Southerners after 1950 is probably a lot more complicated than historians and political scientists have maybe given it credit for being. Texas Baptist um, would be a good example of that. Yes, sir. What you're saying about kind of the complexity of this issue, yeah. it struck me in your slide, I don't remember it, word for word, the one where you were defining the, the religious right early on. Right. And as I was reading that slide, I was thinking that, that by, with the omission of a single word, I think somewhere in there you had something like conservative members of mainline congregations, uh -huh. the entire rest of your slide would effectively define the religious left. Yeah. Uh, folks like Jim Wallace. Absolutely. A union of uh, people of interest in social issues, Roman Catholics, uh, evangelical pr Protestants, and members of mainline. Mm -hmm. So if you're in the conservative, this is essentially the religious left. And I, I think it just shows how fluid and, and dynamic uh, this yeah. all is, and that there's not a, an inherent intrinsic identification with right wing politics. That's right. And you know, one of the interesting things about the Southern Baptist Convention. Um, if you go and look, I mean, several people have looked at this, but Nancy Ammerman did this um, you know, well-known sociological study where she interviewed Southern Baptists in the 1980s. What she basically said is that, you know, you have about 10% who are the true left wing. These are people pushing for rapid social and political change. These are people who, even in the 80s and 90s, are embracing same-sex marriage, embracing abortion rights talking about global peace and very much kind of the left wing of, of Baptist politics. But then you have the other 90% roughly split between fundamentalists who want to change it in a more conservative direction and moderates who really want to keep things the way they are. The Baptists that I'm looking at, and they're very clear about this, they don't even represent the left wing really of the Baptist, Southern Baptist Church. They were moderates. And so when they see this new emphasis on banning abortion or this new emphasis on funding public schools, uh, funding private schools with public money, they think it's a divergence from their history. And they say they're the true conservatives because they kind of want to keep things the same. So it's, it's really, it's diverse, yeah. Another comment, it's funny because I was had a discussion with David Darwin probably two or three years ago. And I'm, I'm Jewish and just as kind of a, an outsider that's just been viewing the, the public discourse on the, the, the fundamentalist moderate uh, uh, war with right. the SBC, I think it was portrayed from the right as a battle between uh, conservatives and these wicked liberals. Yeah. 
really, to me, my understanding is about between fundamentalists and very conservative evangelicals. <laughs> right. were, you know, like you say, there were not a lot of ultra left wing folks in the Baptist communion, and mm -hmm. the people that are being portrayed as liberals are really very centrist to conservative evangelicals. It's no, it's just more fundamentalist. You're absolutely right about that. And um, in, in the larger project, I have almost a whole chapter where I'm kind of going through and proving uh, what these people say over and over again, which is that they really were quite conservative within a broad picture of American religion and politics. Certainly, I would say even more conservative than mainline Protestants, Methodists, and Episcopalians. Um, it's just that they have this belief about church and state separation that goes all the way back to early Baptist experiences in U.S. history. They view it as a bedrock. They don't view it as something that could be easily discarded. Um, and they, again, think of themselves as kind of the true conservatives. Um, you also get a sense, and I hinted at this in this presentation, but I didn't have enough time to go into it deeper. You also get the sense um, there's an anti-Catholic and in some moments, an anti-Jewish element to all of this. You saw that quote in here where they say, um, if you're, basically, if you're going to have uh, Hindus and Jews and Muslims in the school prayer, God doesn't want it. You know, leave it, leave it for the, the private sphere. A lot of this merging of church and state they view as a Catholic institution. And even uh, in 1960, it's sort of fun, uh, funny and interesting. When John Kennedy's running, you have all these Texas Baptists who have been voting Democratic all the way back to the Civil War and certainly through the New Deal and with FDR. And uh, the Baptist standard is very equivocal about whether or not people should support John Kennedy for that reason. They end up at the last second kind of running an editorial where they basically say, you can be a good Baptist and still vote for John Kennedy. Um, and, you know, of course, they do that the week before the election. And then he won Texas very narrowly. So it clearly had an impact. Um, but it's... Yeah, it's very, it's very interesting. And the fact that the fundamentalists defined them as these liberals, really, it doesn't jive with a broader picture of American Protestantism, I don't think. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, this leads into the question I had. Have you found any effect from the Vatican II era? I, I was in seminary in the late 80s. Mm -hmm. and I remember the, this era of good feeling that swept over the the country and all of a sudden Protestants and Catholics were making nice nice and uh, that uh, policies began to change right. uh, as a result of that on both sides of the fence. Uh, Catholics began to yep. do Protestant things and Protestants began to be more open to yeah. things that they had opposed because they were Catholic. You know it's interesting because the moderate faction of Baptists in Texas actually were a lot less excited about that new ecumenical feel than the fundamentalist Baptists, largely because, you know, from at least the 50s on, you see people splitting. And so you might have an Orthodox conservative Catholic finding more common cause with the fundamentalist Baptist than with a liberal Catholic because they're so animated by abortion, gay rights, and politics. So in the 80s, you have the fundamentalists, oddly, saying we can make common cause with the Catholics if it's on like a prayer amendment or an anti-abortion bill. But then the kind of moderate Baptists are saying you've embraced Catholic politics, you know, with this anti-abortion emphasis. So it's an interesting thing to see. Um, the, I don't know if I would call it anti-Catholic or anti-Catholicism, but there is a strong strain of frustration with the Catholic Church and a lot of clearly derogatory references to the Pope that you can find from the moderate faction. So that's one of the interesting um, and somewhat bizarre uh, facets of American religion in the 80s was, as you point out, people who had not been open to those coalitions were willing to work on political issues together. This would also uh, tie into Johnson's administration and his openness to Representative from the Vatican. That's right. Rep representative from um, developing political relations with the Vatican as a country. And, mm -hmm. uh, the, no, in the Kennedy, uh, the Kennedy Johnson uh, campaign and then administration, um, there's a lot of this stuff going on because when Kennedy's running in 1960, there's this great fear that he will lose Texas, which was the, a real centerpiece of the Democratic coalition. 
And, and if, if he would have lost Texas and then Illinois, of course, you know, famously wouldn't have been president. So there's a point where, and I go into this in the, the larger project, there's a point where Bill Moyers, you know, who was friends with Johnson and had been roommates and all that, basically says, you've got to get Kennedy to meet with Baptists in Texas because they don't understand him and he really doesn't understand them. And there's this kind of um, funny communication that goes back because Kennedy was sort of open about the fact that he was, he said, you're right, I don't really understand where they're coming from. Um, but the way Kennedy framed uh, church and state in his famous speech down in Houston to the Baptist Ministers Association, that speech largely came from Moyers and Lyndon Johnson saying, you got to make Texas Baptists feel comfortable with your Catholicism. Turns out it was good politics on a national scale, and who knows what would have happened had he not given that speech. Thank you guys so much. I really I appreciate y'all being here.